morning Southwoods we are so glad that you are here we'd love for you to take a seat real quick my name is Marco I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Southwinds and we're so excited that you joined us for this amazing 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 Sunday at Southwinds as you can just look right over here you see a lot of beautiful kids that are about to come and join us on stage for an amazing uh, musical performance that they uh, sang all week uh, at VBS. We're so excited about that. Qu quick couple things. If you are in the room for the first time or if you're watching online, we'd love to welcome you and say thank you for joining us here at Southwinds. You can join us right in the lobby, right after service, fill out a Connect card, get connected. We'll get you a uh, $5 gas card and a gift card to Starbucks as a thank you for joining us here at Southwinds as a thank you gift from us to you. If you're watching online, you can download our Southwinds Church app and click on connect. Over the next couple of weeks at Southwinds, it's gonna be a really exciting time. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we announced it, but we are entering our 75th year anniversary as a church. That is amazing, that is remarkable. The things that God has done at this church over the last 75 years, we're excited to highlight so many of those awesome things. But we need some volunteers to help pull some of this stuff off. Uh, Harvest Party doesn't get uh, pulled off with just our pastor team. Uh, our, ba our, our barbecue doesn't get pulled off with just our, our pastor team. We need some more volunteers to help sign up. So if you could just go over to our Southwind Church app. Click on the 75th year anniversary logo and there you'll be able to get signed up for a bunch of different teams uh, that are gonna get started over the next couple of weeks. 
Right now, our student ministry is about to kick off. School starts for some schools tomorrow morning. The rest of them will start over the next couple days. But we're excited to ramp up this next school year, but we need your help. We're looking for big brothers, big sisters, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa figures to help pour into the life of our student ministry. Over the 2020, 2020 and 2021 school year, we had over 180 different students come join us on our campus for our midweek uh, student program, and we're looking for more volunteers. You can just join us right in the uh, courtyard right after service. I'll hand you some information. We have a training coming up on August 10th that I would love to invite every single one of you. If you all showed up on August 10th, I wouldn't know what to do, but we'd figure it out. So that'd be really awesome. Also, over this last week, we had hundreds of children come join us for VBS. We had 21 salvations and 35 students, children, wanting to take that uh, next step and get baptized. So we're super excited about what God did in the life of our children's ministry and through uh, Pastor Chris and his team. We're just super thankful. I'm going to invite the kids on up uh, as we show a quick highlight video.
did a wonderful job, didn't they? Let's give them another round of applause. Good job, guys. Good job, students. Make a joyful noise into the Lord, amen? Amen. Okay, we're gonna ask that you stand with us as we continue on into our worship service. The kids have led us, and now we are going to read the Word of God together. So what we're gonna do is a responsive reading. I'm gonna read that first slide. If you could read the second slide that is highlighted in yellow with Teresa and Tobias and Tina, then uh, we can read the Word of God together. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. One generation shall commend your works to another and, and shall declare your mighty acts. They shall speak the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Thank you. 
almighty, wonderful, faithful, just, good, and holy. We worship you and you alone. There is no one else like you. You see us exactly in the place that we are today. When we walked in, you see us, Lord. You know where we're at and we lay ourselves before you as a holy, holy God. We thank you for this morning, for you have created it and we delight in you, Lord God. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to be back. Good to see you again. And we are continuing this morning our summer series, Failing Forward. But before uh, we get into our study of God's word together, I just want to tell you again uh, something I told you when I was here the last time and actually uh, something that Marco mentioned to you during the announcements. We want to make sure that you're really getting it. Um, and it's simply this. We have something really exciting coming this fall, our 75th uh, anniversary as a church. And we are going to uh, be celebrating over a 10-week period. It's going to be in a lot of ways like, like normal uh, gathering together as God's people. But there's going to be a lot of special things that are happening each week uh, from September 18th. Uh, until November 20th, and you're just going to want to be here um, every Sunday that you can. We're going to be learning uh, about and remembering uh, some of the amazing things that God has done in our history, and we're also going to be dreaming uh, about what God is going to do uh, in our future. And uh, there's a lot of things that we're planning right now, and as Marco said, and I want to highlight, uh, we need your help to make them happen. If you have uh, any possibility of serving in any way, um, please let us know. You may have some things you can do that we're not even thinking of yet, uh, but if you'll just say, hey, I'm available, um, I wanna serve the Lord in this way, just send an email to info at southwinds.org and we'll get in touch with you and uh, we'll start uh, working on seeing what is gonna happen this fall. Well, if you've been here uh, during the last month, you know that we have been looking at people in the Bible who failed, and we've been looking at how, how God uh, worked to redeem their failures so that we can learn how God can redeem our failures. And, and I'll, as you in, uh, open your Bible, I'm gonna invite you to do that to the book of 2 Samuel. We're gonna be in two different chapters, chapter 11 and 12, uh, where we're gonna be learning today. I wanna tell you a true story. This is a story about a, a man named Rogers Cadenhead, and he is a self-described domain hoarder. I don't know if you know what a domain hoarder does, but uh, if you don't, domain hoarders are people who go out and they register hundreds, even thousands of domains for websites uh, that no one currently owns in the hope that sometime in the future, someone, hopefully with a lot of money, is gonna want one of those websites and is gonna wanna buy the website that they own. Max Lucado, in one of his books, tells what happened to Rogers Cadenhead back in around 2005 when he heard that a new pope was going to be elected. He went out and he started registering all kinds of domains with every possible pope name that he could think of. And he hit the jackpot. He guessed the right one. And it wasn't too long after the new pope was elected that the Vatican called and asked if he'd be willing to sell. And they actually offered him thousands of dollars. But it, it turns out Rogers Cadenhead is himself a Catholic. And he kind of felt like it was wrong to sell the domain to the church. And so he said, you know, I, I really don't want any money. Instead, and he, he actually told this on the Today Show, he said, what I want is three things. Number one, one of those hats. Number two, a free stay at the Vatican Hotel. And number three, complete absolution, no questions asked for the third week of March, 1987. <laughs> Anyone else ever have a week like that? Maybe a month, maybe a year? Like, like if there was a video of your entire life, are there any files that you would wanna make sure were deleted and destroyed? Well, I think most people have a third week 
of March 1987. And we're going to see, maybe you already know, King David actually did himself. That's the passage we're looking at today, 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And it's actually a pretty familiar story for many people. It's the account, if you don't know already, of David and Bathsheba. And if you know the story, you know it's a story of massive failure. It's a story about heart failure, a story about the failure of David's heart, this, this man after God's own heart. And to, to really understand this familiar story, you really need to be aware of something that's been happening right before. And if you're to turn back a few chapters, and you can do this later, you, you can go back all the way to 2 Samuel 7. You'll see that God is promising David. He's gonna establish him as king. And he promises that all of David's descendants are gonna rule over Israel forever. And then that one day, a king will come from David's line who will reign on the throne forever and ever and ever. And then in chapters 8 and 9 and 10, it's just like this, this highlight reel of David doing everything right. One after another, it's this series of cascading victories over and over again where David defeats one enemy after another. These enemies coming against God's people, the Philistines, the Moabites, the, the Syrians, the Edomites. And we read repeatedly summary statements like this, the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. And David seems to be doing everything right. His life is blessed. But then we come to 2 Samuel 11. And if you're reading through this book and you're reading carefully, you'll notice that at this chapter, everything kind of slows down almost grinds to a stop. The narrative goes into this great detail to show us this, this great failure in David's life. And I'm gonna walk us through this story this morning, explaining some things along the way, pointing out some principles. And then at the end, very quickly, I'm gonna show you three important truths that we need for our lives for recovering from failure. So let's begin in verse one, chapter 11. It says this, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained, that Hebrew word remained literally a sat. David remained in Jerusalem. So in the, the winter back then, kings and kingdoms didn't fight in the winter because of the weather. But when spring came and the weather cleared and the roads dried up, kings would go, go out and kingdoms would fight. They would protect their territory. They try to win new territory. And, and we know from these accounts that the Israelites were constantly fighting these people, the Ammonites. And it's right here. You may not have noticed it, but it's right here that David's great failure begins. The, the wording of this verse is very intentional. The narrator is signaling to us that the king, David, is not where a king is supposed to be. The Hebrew uh, literally says David sent Joab and David sat in Jerusalem. And it's his first bad decision. He's not leading. He's not doing his job. And uh, there's a Hebrew scholar over at Berkeley, a world-known, renowned scholar of Hebrew. His name is Robert Alter. And he says that this verb to send, he points out it happens 11 times in this chapter. It brackets and frames the chapter. And the narrator is telling us that David, this man of action, David, this incredible warrior, is incredibly passive. David is sending and sending and sending. He's getting other people to do work for him. And Alter writes that David is now this sedentary king who has removed himself from the field of action and endowed himself with a dangerous amount of leisure. For some of us, I think, especially during the last two years at home during COVID, this might be a great summary of our lives. We have found ourselves at many times with a dangerous amount of leisure, and we know today it hasn't been good for us. Someone said this should be another great chapter about David's great victories over the Ammonites, but instead it's a chapter about the greatest tragedy in David's life because David started out in the wrong place. And the first principle I wanna point out to you is just know where you are. 
Do you know where you are? Don't put yourself in dangerous places because here's the reality. Have you seen this in your life? The reality is this, all sin starts small. So this warning leads to a question that you should ask yourself even today, even if things are going well for you today. And the question is, where are you? Do you know? David is in the wrong place. Sun Tzu, in his ancient classic, The Art of War, he says repeatedly, do not linger in dangerously isolated positions. He says, if you position your army in the wrong place, you are setting yourself up for failure. And it's true in our lives that sometimes our comforts become our greatest source of compromise. David is relaxing. David is chilling out. David is sending other people to do his bidding. He's become passive, and it's a reality. When you don't find a productive pastime, the enemy will always present you with a destructive one. Now, at this point, David hasn't sinned yet, but he's put himself in a dangerous place. And verse two says, one evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of his palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, the the Hebrew word evening is more like our late afternoon, and so even though it was customary in that part of the world in that time to, to take you know a, an afternoon nap, what we might call a siesta, this tells us that David has been asleep a very long time. Again, to quote Robert Alter, he says, the recumbent king has been in bed an inordinately long time. So this is warning number two. David is not only in the wrong place, he's making bad use of time. And so, question for each of us, what do you do with your time? Where do you go? Where do you sit? What do you allow your eyes to see? You might say, in this case, that laziness leads to lust. And many of you have discovered that that when you compromise, it's often because in these moments of relaxation, maybe moments of fatigue, you're just letting anything the world has to offer come and fill up your vision. In the the best-selling book, Atomic Habits, James Clear talks about something called choice architecture. Maybe you know about this. He says, so many of our choices are, are not so much about what we want, but where things are. And he talks about a hospital that was trying to get people to drink more water than, you know, Cokes. And, and all they decided to do is they just put waters everywhere. You could buy them everywhere. They were all over the place. They didn't advertise. They didn't tell people they should drink more water. They just placed them in people's sale field of vision. And, and water sales went up 25%. It's the same reason why Coca-Cola is always buying that end cap at the grocery store. Because they have learned if they put those things where you can see them, sales go up. We tend to do what we see. So what are you putting before your eyes? Here's the second principle. Guard what you see. Guard what you allow into your mind. David's setting himself up for failure. He's on the roof of his palace when he should have been out in the field with his army. He's taking long naps. He's got nothing to do. And just as he's doing this, he's not setting out to do something wrong. He's just being careless. He, he, he sees this beautiful woman bathing. I want to say a couple of things about this. There's a lot of misconceptions about Bathsheba, and one of the misconceptions that many people have is that she's bathing on the roof. A lot of you think that's where she is. What's she doing up on the roof taking a bath? But I want you to look at the text again. The text doesn't say she's on the roof. It just says David's on the roof, I want you to notice if you keep reading the story, there's nothing there that ever suggests, not one time, that Bathsheba was doing anything inappropriate. And we'll explain more of that later. But David sees, and then David again sends, there's that word, he sends someone to find out about her. And this guy comes back, we don't know his name, he's just a servant, he's just a man, and he, he is trying to warn David. Did you notice it? He, he says, she's Eliam's daughter, We find out later that Eliam was one of David's mighty men. That was the name the Bible gave to David's top 30 warriors, like his, you know, personal commander unit, like they were a combination of Navy SEALs and personal bodyguards, secret service agents all wrapped up together. And he also says, she's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. 
He, he was another one of David's mighty men. The servant is saying, David, David, stop, because he intuits, I think, what David is doing. He says, don't depersonalize her. She's a person. She has a name. She has a family. She has a story. We find out later in the account that she was also the granddaughter of Ahithophel, who was David's chief advisor. He was this guy, you know, who saw around corners, could almost see the future. He was, you know, playing chess like 10 moves down, you know, the board. David always kept him at his side to advise him. And so this kind of means that like Bathsheba is like the daughter of James Bond and the wife of Jason Bourne and the grandson, a granddaughter of Sherlock Holmes. I mean, all together, all wrapped into one. Like on so many levels, this is a very bad idea. But David ignores the warning signs. This gives us another principle. We need to stay in community and accountability. Don't ignore warnings. God will bring warnings into your life. He always warns us for our protections. He warns David, but David just keeps going. David just keeps making bad decisions, one bad decision after another. Verse four, then David sent messengers to get her, to take her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness and then she went back home. And in this account, what we see as we read it is that David's sin just happened suddenly. The Hebrew here is very abrupt. He sent, the messengers get, they take. She came, David slept with her. And the buildup toward this is very slow, but the act, the sin is fast. And maybe you've noticed in your life when you play around with sin, sin gains momentum and sin starts moving faster. And at some point, there is almost an inevitability to that sin, right? David breaks through barrier after barrier until he sins, until he fails. And, and he's about to discover something we all need to know. You get to control inputs, you don't get to control outcomes. So why this detail about purifying? Well, there's really no accidental details in this story. And this is telling us that she is doing something for a very specific reason. Uh, Bathsheba is actually obeying the law that we find in, you know, in the Torah, the, the law that called her to ritually bathe each month so that she could be ceremonially clean. And so this detail is letting us know that, that her bath is not an attempt to display her body. It's not an attempt to seduce David. She was simply obeying the command of God's word as part of her devotion to God. And, and also, let me just say this. We, we tend to picture her without any clothes on, but I wanna ask you a question. Does the text say that? She may not even be exposing her body in a significant way. We, we don't know that for sure. It's possible, and some of you would know that, and if you think about it, it's not hard to figure out. It's possible to bathe with, without you know, taking off all of your, your clothing. Remember, she's not in a shower. She's just not in a bathtub. She's probably drawing water out of a, uh, of a container of some, some kind. And so, so this detail is there for a purpose. And, and we just need to know as we look at this that, that though some people try to paint Bathsheba as a seductress, and you probably have heard sermons about this. This is not what is going on here. Again, let me tell you, there is no indication anywhere in these chapters that there is a condemnation of any kind against her. The author is telling us what happens here is totally because of David's sin. So this is not the story of an affair. This is a story about a man who uses his power to sexually exploit a woman and then uses his power to cover it up. Kind of sounds current, doesn't it? Kind of sounds like stuff that we see happening all around us even today. Verse five tells us what happens next. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. So it's now over a month later and now comes the cover up. David makes a plan. Turns out it's gonna be plan A, verses six through nine. So David sent, there's that word again, sent, sent this word to Joab, send me uh, 
Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, how the war was going. And stop right there. It's really interesting. When David asked Joab uh, how Joab and the soldiers and the war were going, he, he repeatedly three times uses a, a Hebrew uh, verb that's a form of the word shalom. Tell me about the shalom of Joab, about the shalom of the soldiers about the shalom of the, the war. David is asking about shalom while he's ripping shalom apart. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And so Uriah left the palace and a gift was sent after him. So that's plan A. David sends for Uriah. He hopes Uriah will come home and sleep with his wife. He sends a present, you know, some food, some wine, some cheese. We don't know. And it's just going to be like this in David's mind. Shower, supper, sex. That's how it rolls. David hopes a few months from now, maybe Uriah's not that really good at math and he's going to think it's his kid. See, David wants to control the outcomes, but Uriah doesn't go home. Verses 9 and 10 says, but Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? And you have to wonder if a little bit of panic is creeping into David's mind. Uriah's reply shows his integrity, depth of character, Verse 11, Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Uriah is actually practicing something that David has practiced in the past. You can look it up. He's showing solidarity with the men. He's, he's setting his body apart for this sacred act of doing war for the Lord. He's just gonna go home when the battle is over. So that means plan A is not gonna work. Well, David comes up with a plan B, and you could call plan B this, do shots with Uriah. <laughs> Verses 12 and 13, then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. This tells us drunk Uriah has a stronger moral compass than sober David. And also, Uriah is a Hittite. Did you notice that? He's not one of God's chosen people, the Israelites. And this shows us here, we see an outsider who is a more true follower of God than God's own chosen king. David has a decision now. Do I confess? Repent? I mean, he could. It's what he ought to do, but he just keeps taking steps in the wrong direction. And we see the principle that when sin is concealed, sin compounds. Have you ever noticed that? It's like it says in James chapter one, each one is tempted by his own evil desire and then desire conceives and then desire gives birth to sin and then sin gives birth to death and David is just walking and walking further and further down a path that is going away from life and heading to death. He's running out of options. And all he can do is either confess or conceal because our choices have consequences. There's really no escape from this, David, if he's beginning to see someone is going to have to suffer for the pain that David has caused. And so David the king decides that it should be Uriah. Next step is a big one, plan C. Verses 14 and 15, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. And David gives this sealed letter with what amounts to a death warrant to Uriah. He commands Uriah to take his own death warrant to do to Joab. I mean, this is cold. And what's happened so far? 
mean, you just think about it. Just kind of roll the tape back in incremental ways. David has rationalized sin. David has coveted another man's wife. David has committed adultery by assaulting another man's wife. David has lied about what he has done. David is now committing murder. It's like a half the Ten Commandments. Verses 16 and 17 say, So, while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. So Joab just follows David's orders. Verses 18 and following say, Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, when you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up and he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know they would shoot arrows from the wall? I mean, who killed Abimelech, son of Jerub, Basheth? Didn't a woman drop an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. I want you to notice something here. Maybe you've never thought about this before because you're so focused on, uh, on Uriah. But, but this tells us not only did Uriah die, but to make sure that Uriah died, many other soldiers die as well. And David has murdered them all. And we see the principle here that sin's consequences compound is kind of like a bomb blast that sends out shock waves and keeps destroying as it goes. The impact of sin just spreads and intensifies and, and multiplies. Verse 22 says the messenger set out and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, the men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. And I want you to see what happens next with David. David's response is stunning and not in a good way. Verse 25, David told the messenger, say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the tack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. See, David doesn't care. He, he tells him to just say to Joab, yeah, you win some, you lose some. And he's supposed to be leading and shepherding Israel. He's the king, but he is not doing his job. Verse 26 and 7 says, when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. Now this is stunning and shocking to us, but it was common in that time for another man to offer to be the redeemer for a widowed woman to, to take care of her. And that's what is happening in this case. Of course, there is something different. David here is offering himself for his, uh, his fallen you know, soldier Uriah. How noble. He's offering to be the father of this child. And David probably thinks that his problems are all solved He's probably concluded, you know, in the end, might makes right. In the end, the powerful get to do what they want. Kings make the rules. That's what David is thinking. But then we get to the very last line of the chapter, the second half of verse 27. And in that, the narrator tells us this. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Oh, yeah, the Lord. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed it, but in this whole chapter has been not one mention of God or the Lord, not one. The, the Hebrew word in this chapter, the Hebrew word Yahweh, which is what translates Lord, it is literally the final word and it reminds us that God always has the final word. He always does. There's an interesting thing that's kind of masked by the English translation, unless you have certain translations. If you did, maybe you noticed, David tells Joab not to be upset in the NIV. The ESV and some other translations say, David tells Joab not to be displeased. And it's the same word 
that says the Lord is displeased. And literally, it's, it's, it could be translated this way. Don't let this be evil in your eyes, Joab. But then the Lord says, no, this is evil in my eyes. God always has the final word. This brings us to the next chapter, chapter 12. And if you have been paying attention, you'll notice that David's pretty much been doing all the sending so far, but now, now the Lord sends. And the Lord sends the prophet Nathan, and he's gonna tell David a story. Verse one, it says, the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. Verse two, the rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. And the narrator is very intentionally, did you notice that using words that he's used before, words that he's used before about David, eat and drink and lie or sleep, lay. Same things David has done. Did you notice he said the sheep was like a daughter, which is exactly what David's servant had warned David about Bathsheba and there's even more than that. The, the word daughter is bat in Hebrew. And this daughter, bat, laid in this man's arms. And that word laid is Shabbat in Hebrew. Bat, Shabbat, Bathsheba. Verse four. Now, A traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep and cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler to come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. And at this point, the king cannot be silent. He interrupts the story David does at this point because he is furious. Verses five and six say, David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and he had no pity. And now the prophet drops the hammer. Verse seven, then Nathan said to David, you are the man. You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the house of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah and if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why? God continues through the prophet, why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in my eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and you took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. David is confronted by the Lord. You are that man, David, so confess your sin. And this is the choice that we all have biblically. We confess, we forsake, we find forgiveness and mercy. That's our choice. But we must not think that we can belong to the Lord and hide our sin. We can expose it and confess it and forsake it and find mercy. And in love, if we don't do that, in love, God, he will expose us. Those are the options. It is part of God's grace to us. Do you understand? It is the grace that taught. The grace that taught my heart to fear. You know, God sends Nathan It's not the only time he's done something like that. He may send someone to you. 
God also may send you like Nathan to a friend and maybe you need to have a hard conversation and, and you just might save their life. Here's another principle. When we sin, we always sin against God's goodness and blessing. And that's what God is telling David. God had given David so much. He said, David, David, I anointed you king. I protected you from Saul. I gave you wealth and power. I gave your master's wives into your arms. These symbols of prestige. And if that wasn't enough, I would have given you even more. You see, sin and failure always begins where contentment ends. And so one of the things we must do in our lives is we fight sin and we fight failure with contentment. We make ourselves content in God and in God's blessings. Do you understand? And some of you, maybe you came today and this is what you need to hear. Do you understand that gratitude is one of your greatest weapons against temptation? Because resentment so often pushes us into the arms of temptation. Some of you today are so entitled. Your mind is always thinking, I deserve this. I deserve that. I should have this. I should have that. You think you should have it. Even if God says you should not have it, you must not have it. It will destroy you if you take it. You're entitled, you think. And God says, no, no. You deserve nothing. Everything you have has come to you out of my goodness, out of my blessings. We must be aware of entitlement. David thinks he's entitled, but the Bible says it is godliness with contentment that is great gain. Also, I want you to know that right here, if you see it, God puts himself on the side of the oppressed. He puts himself on the side of the weak over against the strong who, who use their power to abuse. He says, no, David, I stand with the Bathshebas and the Uriahs of this world. I am on their side. You have despised my word. You have despised me by hurting and using them because I love people. You use people. God issues a judgment in verse 10. He says, the sword will never depart from your house. And think about this. God had given David a house. And David brought sin into the house. He, he brought a sword into the house. And God said, it's a double-edged sword. And that side of the sword is now swinging back at you, David. Verse 11, this is what the Lord said out of your own household. I am going to bring calamity on you before your very eyes. I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. This is actually a very terrifying thing. I mean, when David as the king and the king was the judge, so David, when he issued his judicial pronouncements against that man in the story that it should be a fourfold judgment because he had taken that other man's sheep. What we are going to see if we keep reading the story chapter by chapter on into 2 Samuel, we're gonna watch this play out in David's life, a fourfold judgment. We will watch, you can look it up, four of his children die because of his sin. The child that is in Bathsheba's belly is gonna die. His son Amnon is going to rape David's child, his half-sister Tamar, and then he's gonna be killed by one of his brothers in revenge. His son Absalom is going to usurp David on the throne, and Absalom's gonna be killed by Joab, this commander that David has brought into this mess. And then David's son Adonijah is going to attempt to steal the throne from David. And he's gonna be killed by another one of his brothers. The innocent will die. He's gonna have a sexually perverse son. He's going to have a murderous son. He's going to have a power-hungry son. The sins of the father get reproduced in the children. And this tells us this. We have to fight sin while it's small because it costs too much Later, And I am not trying here to shame anyone because there is grace coming, I, I promise. I mean, I know this has been heavy, but I am telling you, we must realize that the enemy wants us to say it's so small, this won't matter, it, it really won't have an impact, so let's just do whatever you do you, do what feels good, what feels right. But we know where it goes, we know where it goes, and I'm telling you today, if you don't want to go there, 
then don't start here. If you don't like those outcomes, then change the inputs. Well, finally, we get to the grace. Verse 13, chapter 12. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. And David humbly repents and confesses and God graciously forgives. And this bothers some people. Maybe it's bothering you right now. David says, I sinned. And God says, it's all good. A year ago, that's it? He did all that and he just gets off? It's kind of funny. We live in a time where a whole lot of modern people look at the Old Testament God and they don't like him. They, they criticize the Old Testament God as they see it for him being so harsh and so judgmental. And then you come to something like this and people get mad at God because he's not more judgmental. See, you're mad at God for being too just. And now you're mad because he's not just enough. I mean, how could God do this? Well, God is not going to remove from David the promises God has made, but there will be penalties in David's life. There will be consequences. And we won't have time to read it, but, but this word death is gonna show up many more times in what's ahead. Death is coming to David's house. There are going to be consequences he cannot avoid. And yet, and yet God is quick to show mercy and maybe you don't like the mercy in this story. But isn't it true that every single one of us wants it when we find ourselves in David's place? Anybody willing to say amen about that? I mean, who here is without sin? Who here is without sexual sin of some kind? And we listen to David's story, and if you're really hearing it, it ought to terrify you. It is terrifying, but there is also hope, and we'll see that. I want to really quickly give you three truths that warn us and comfort us and help us whenever we have to deal with our own heart failure. And the first truth is this. It's about the power of sin. You need to understand sin is powerful. This story shows us something very important. It shows us that every one of us is capable of sinning in ways we may have a hard time imagining. I mean, look at this. David is a hero. David is the king. David is the man after God's own heart. And yet, we find him guilty of adultery, of sexual assault, of lying, of, of murder. I mean, are you here today and you have entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ? Is that true of you? Are you born again? Are, are you saved? If so, you are capable of everything that David did. I mean, think about it. David wrote so many of the Psalms that we all love to read, we still read today, including Psalm 40, which has this verse, verse eight, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. David wrote that. David meant that. And he still did all of this. Tim Keller tells us that the story, this story teaches us that the seeds of the most terrible atrocities live in every human heart and even in people whom God has saved. You see, in all of our hearts, there are seeds. Seeds of pride, seeds of ingratitude, seeds of self-pity and selfishness and seeds of envy. And what this story is telling us is this, if those seeds fall in the right soil and if those seeds are watered in the right way, they will become the kind of things you see in this story and what you see in the headlines every day. So I just wanna encourage you as your pastor who loves you, never say, I would never do that. If you say, I would never do that, you have just opened the door. You have just made yourself more vulnerable to the possibility of one day actually doing that. Guard your hearts because sin is powerful. Second, second truth, the pain of consequences. See, God forgives David fully. He is forgiven. It's not, it's real. 
He's forgiven, but he doesn't remove the consequences of David's sin. I've already mentioned the four sons of David who will die. Nathan says that, that, that David looked at Bathsheba from the roof. He took her in the dark and in secret, and one of David's sons is gonna sleep with David's wife on, on the roof in broad daylight. Consequences are coming, and, and David accepts that. And David doesn't make excuses. He doesn't blame. He says, I did it. And he accepts what is coming. And let me tell you something I have learned over the years in my own life and in dealing with people for 35 plus years as a pastor. The people who repent truly are the people who accept the consequences. If you have confessed something to God and you think you have repented and you find yourself bridling, angry at what's happening as a result of your sin, you haven't fully repented. You have to accept the consequences. This is the way God life works. We, we can choose our inputs. We cannot choose the outcomes. But then, third, and this is so good, there is the possibility of redemption you know, there are at least two Psalms David writes about this, about how God forgave and how God restored and God redeemed. And, and it's interesting, even here in verse 13, where it says, the Lord has taken away or put away your sin. This doesn't mean that God isn't saying it's sin is a big deal. Literally, you could translate that Hebrew verb, God passes over your sin. And it takes us back to the Passover, the Passover in the Old Testament. And in the Passover, the sins of God's people were not just put away, they were put on someone else. The idea behind this verb is the idea of transfer. And it is reminding us that all decisions have consequences. And David, he deserves judgment, but the son of David, Jesus Christ, he who knew no sin, he became sin for us. Our sin is put on him. Paul wrestles with this passage in Romans. He, he says, God left, he left all the sins unpunished. If he does that, how can he be just? And Paul says, because all that debt, all that sin fell on Jesus so that God could both be just and the justifier so that God can say there is justice. And this just tells us if you have been abused, if you have been hurt, there will be justice. No one ever gets away with anything in God's universe. Every sin one day will be paid for either in eternity in hell or on the cross. And yet, the beauty for all of us is that we're all sinners and we need that cross and so God provides that redemption. He sent a son where David, his son, failed. And notice here at the beginning of his kingdom, David's kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, at the beginning of this kingdom, we already see the fall because there really are no human heroes. I mean, think about it. Think about it. David, like he's the best guy, the best guy we got, and he's assaulting and murdering people. We need a savior. We need a savior who's not like us. And good news, people, we have one, and his name is Jesus. Amen. And he's the son of David, and he's the son of God. And God the Father has transferred our sin onto Jesus, God's son. It's fascinating, and we don't have time to get into it all, but verses 24 and 25 say this, then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and made love to her. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon, now, this word Solomon is built off the word peace. You can hear it, Solomon, Shalom, they're related. And, and, it, and it causes this question to be asked, can there be peace after devastating sin in your life? The answer is yes, there can. And just in case you might be thinking, well, that sounds like wishful thinking on David and Bathsheba's part, it says this in the rest of the verse, and the Lord loved him. The Lord loved him. God looks at little Solomon and he loves him. He's gonna make him king. God's gonna put his grace on him so much that, that this Nathan, the prophet who had brought so much condemnation from God, says in the next verse, and because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan, the prophet, to name him Jedediah, 
And Jedidiah means loved by, cherished by Yahweh. David and Bathsheba say, we're gonna name him peace, that the anger of God is no longer coming. And God's like, okay, you can call him peace, that's good, but let me take it a step further. I'm gonna call him beloved, loved. Jedidiah, that's your name. Loved by God. And it's no accident. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament that we read, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. The Bible over and over and over calls those who have come to know the sacrifice of the son of Jesus, the son of David, Jesus. We are called in Jesus, beloved. You are loved. Your sin has been paid for. Your shame has been buried. You do not have to carry it anymore. God does not want you to. He paid for it. He passed over it. And so we can grieve our sin, but we can pick our heads up and we can rise up and we can move past our sin. Failure does not have to define us. You know, we can be warned by passages like this to not repeat mistakes that will cost us. And yet you need to hear today, you are not doomed to failure. David wasn't, and you aren't either. See, we all walk in. All today, we all walk in sinners, every one of us, amen? amen. We, all, we all need to realize that. But as sinners, we get to say, because God says that there is grace for all of us. There is grace even for the Davids, and that means there's grace for you. You don't have to act like you're perfect, okay? We don't want you to do that. It's weird when you act like that because we know you're not. That's why we say around here at Southwinds, no perfect people allowed. But that's why we need grace. And that's where God gives grace. There's peace, there's grace, there's love. And so today, if you are someone whose heart has failed, maybe in what we would call a small way, Maybe in what we might call a massive way, your heart has failed. If this is you, then hear the word of the Lord. There's grace, there's peace, there's love for you because God has taken your failure and he has put it on his son. And Jesus, son of David, has borne the penalty for our sin, your sin and my sin, so that we don't have to bear it. We can be restored. We can be redeemed. This is the word of the Lord. And won't you say Southwinds with great gratitude, amen. 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 Would you bow your heads as we pray? Father, we thank you that you love us. We thank you, Lord, that you love people that fail. And so, Father, we ask you that you would remind us today that there's no sin that's beyond your grace and your mercy. Father, if anyone is here today that's living under the shame of their sin, Lord, we ask that you would lift their shame and you would show them their gra- your grace. You would set them free. Lord, remind us today of the seriousness of sin, that sin has consequences. Remind us, Lord, to stay far from sin and to stay close to you, close to your love, close to your your grace and your mercy. Or maybe there is someone here who has never, never received your grace. Lord, may they meet you today. Would you grant them repentance? Would you awaken life in them? Would you call them to your son? May they turn to Jesus and seek his forgiveness and be born again. Lord, we pray for all of these things in the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus and all God's people said.
glad that you are here this morning. Have a wonderful week. God bless you. You're dismissed.